saint or sinner? Which are you this morning? It's kind of a trick question, though. Saint or sinner? You know, as Christians, we go through a battle. We go through a real paradox every day. And the paradox is that we are saved, we're born again, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, but yet also inside of us we have this intense warfare of the sin that's in our members. And I don't know about you, but for me, some days I feel like a saint, and some days I feel like a real sinner. And I think all of us can relate to that. We have good days, and bad days, right? And, but there's a backstory and there's a bigger context to what we go through every day that we really need to understand lest we get discouraged. And so that is what we want to talk about today. Saint or sinner, the answer is for us as Christians, both. And we have to deal with that and understand that or else we're going to get so discouraged and so under condemnation that we're going to be tempted to give up. So everything I'm going to say this morning is not in any way excusing or condoning sin. You know, we use the expression quite a bit that we are obeying more and sinning less. That is the goal. But you know, there's an expression, I know you've heard it, Sometimes I don't like the way that it's used because it sounds like a cop-out, but sometimes it's very accurate when people say it is what it is. And the battle that we have going on inside of us between righteousness and sin, it is what it is. And you have to understand it. You have to accept it. And you have to be patient with the process or else you will be overcome with discouragement in the fight. So I just put there in your notes to start it off. There's times when we know beyond all doubt that God has forgiven us. He's caused us to be regenerated. He's filled us with the Holy Spirit. And yet there's times when the mind can't reconcile those facts with the pride and the selfishness and the carnality that we still see evidenced in our lives. Do you all ever have those feelings of, my gosh, look at what I just said, look at what I just did, look at my thoughts that I'm thinking right now. How can I be born again? Am I really a Christian at all? And those are the accusations of the enemy, and that's the battle that we need to understand so that we don't become overburdened with guilt and condemnation. It's a true spiritual paradox. And as Christians, there are a lot of paradoxes that we live out every day. But this one has got to be at the top of the list, or at least near the top of the list, because we face this warfare within us day in and day out. This is how Charles Spurgeon described it. The believer is a new creature. He belongs to a holy generation and a peculiar people. The Spirit of God is in him, and in all respects, he is far removed from the natural man. But for all of that, the Christian is a sinner still. He is so from or because of the imperfection of his nature and will continue so to the end of his earthly life. The black fingers of sin leave smuts upon our fairest robes. Sin mars our repentance ere the great potter has finished it upon the wheel. Selfishness defiles our tears, and unbelief tampers with our faith. The best thing we ever did apart from the merit of Jesus only swelled the number of our sins. For when we have been most pure in our own sight, yet like the heavens we are not pure in God's sight. And as he charged his angels with folly, much more must he charge us with it, even in our most angelic frames of mind. Think about what he's saying there. The the very best that you have ever done for God 
in service to God, in love with God, is still marred by carnality because that is what's in our flesh. The song which thrills to heaven and seeks to emulate seraphic strains hath human discords in it. I love this last paragraph. The prayer which moves the arm of God is still a bruised and battered prayer and only comes that arm because the sinless one, the great mediator, has stepped in to take away the sin of our supplication. Just think about that on Sunday nights as we're praying. Our prayers are at best bruised and battered. But thank God for Jesus, the intercessor, who steps in. And thank God that by the Holy Spirit, we enter into His very intercession as we're praying. Have you ever felt like this, Psalms 38, verse 4? This is a psalm of David. This is the man after God's own heart. This was a great warrior, a great worshiper of God. And this is how he felt at this point in his life. For my iniquities have gone over my head. Like a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and fester because of my foolishness. I am utterly bowed down and prostrate. All the day I go about mourning, for my sides are filled with burning, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble feeble and crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. Have you experienced that? If you have experienced that, if you have days like that, first of all, thank God that you have a conscience. Thank God that you can still be convicted. Because some people have seared their conscience to the place where they don't feel guilt anymore. Thank God that you and I do. But what David is describing here is exactly what we want to avoid and why we're talking about it this morning. I don't know if we'll finish this morning. We may have to carry over into Thursday. But this place where David is right now can be a very dangerous place to be. There's a good side of it, and then there's the bad side of it. But how David is is feeling here, and we've talked about this many times, that type of despair is what caused Judas to go and kill himself because he thought there was no way God could ever forgive him. And quite the opposite is true. God could have forgiven him. And so when we go through these ups and downs in our spiritual life, it will bring you Great stability if you understand some of the principles that we're going to talk about this morning. You remember the verses, how the Apostle Paul talks about himself? And Paul, was not, he was not a man given to false humility or to sarcasm or, you know, he's very straightforward in the epistles that he writes. So consider these. And let it sink in that this is actually how Paul saw himself. He saw himself as the very least of all saints. He saw himself as one that was born again by an abortive birth. If you remember that in 1 Corinthians 15, it says that I was, he said, I was born again in an, un, in an untimely fashion or out of time which really when you look it up in the Greek, it's talking about an abortion. And what he's saying is, I was late. The circumstances surrounding my conversion were rather bizarre. I shouldn't be where I am today. But that's where he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. He considered himself the least of all the apostles. Wow. <laughs> He considered himself the chief of all sinners. What was David, and what was Paul, excuse me, what was Paul going through that this is how he saw himself? And I just want you to see every true man and woman of God goes through these low points. And they all go through these kind of doubts. It's natural. 
it's, it's part of the fight. It comes with the battle. It is what it is. And we're not going to be free until we get to heaven. Because as long as we have this flesh, we are going to be fighting sin within. A.W. Tozer said, the most godly Christian is the one who knows himself best, and no one who knows himself will believe that he deserves anything better than hell. Once you really, I mean, do you look at yourself sometimes and say, how in the world am I ever going to make it to heaven? Look at my life. Look what I'm still dealing with. That's what we want to talk about for this morning. How do we reconcile my standing before God with my residual carnality? And the reason why I expressed it that way, what is our standing before God in Christ? We know that in Christ, our sins have been forgiven. Have you, do you ever go through, you know, when you have sin to confess, do you ever go through a little panic attack? Like, oh my God, is he going to forgive me this time? But when that panic sets in, just remind yourself that that sin you're about to confess, he knew about it before the creation of time. And there on the cross of Calvary, Jesus already bore that sin that you're getting ready to confess. He bore it 2,000 years ago on the cross. It is already forgiven with every other sin that you have and will commit. And so, put it in that context, and when you come with sincere sorrow in your heart for what, he, for what you've done, of course he's going to forgive you. Remember 1 John 1, 9. He is faithful and just to forgive you. He will forgive you each and every time when you come with repentance, and not only is he faithful to forgive, but it's just for him to forgive you. Because of what Jesus endured on the cross, you legally have been set free from the punishment for your sins. You can think of it this way, it would be unjust for God not to forgive you because of what Jesus did on the cross. So how do I reconcile my standing before God? I mean, in Jesus Christ, I stand before my Father sinless. Not one sin on my account. As you're standing before Father this morning, you're perfect. You have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So how do I reconcile that with all of this vile junk that I wrestle with throughout the week? Well, we've already said sin must never be condoned or excused or ignored. and So that's not the purpose of what we're saying but we do have to understand these principles. Number one, I am saved. God continues to forgive even when my performance is so poor. I've got to remember that not only does God forgive my sin, but simultaneously he's working to cleanse me. Because if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me. But it doesn't just stop with the forgiveness. He's faithful and just also to cleanse me from all of my sin. And so he's working to work that out of your heart, to remove it from your life. We think of it in terms of, uh, you know, there's got to be a, a special formula. It's like going on a diet. If I do this and this, then this will fix it. And it doesn't work that way. It never works that way. Because he says, it says that his word goes deep into our heart and he starts at the level of your motive. And so changes towards holiness never happen as quickly as we would like them to happen because he starts deep within at the root and works his way from the inside out. And when he affects the change, when you, when you finally get free from that habit or from that sin, it's done right when God does it. But remember that other quote from A.W. Tozer where he said, beware of tinkering with your inner life because of this reason. I can't fix myself. Only God can fix what's wrong with me. We are all broken, 
damaged. We have an inclination towards sin. We fight it every day. We are proud. We're selfish. There's things that are wrong, wrong with me that I don't even see, at least not yet. And I can't fix any of that. Only God can change and fix what's wrong with me. Things that have been done to you, things that have warped your, percept- your perception, warped the way that you think, He's the only one that can heal that. Psychology won't do it. Man's wisdom won't do it. It's got to be God working in your heart. And so we have to submit to His work and to His timing. We would love for it to be right now. I want to be free right now. I, I want to never do that again right now. And sometimes a miracle like that can happen, but most of the time it doesn't happen that way. We're going to have to go through a process. The other thing you have to remember is we have not yet obtained all that the cross of Calvary has provided. And we'll go a little bit deeper into that in a moment. But we're in kind of a strange period of grace right now where legally we are pronounced righteous and we are perfect and sinless before our Heavenly Father, yet at the same time we're still contending with this sin from within. And that warfare is what it is. It's not going to change until we get to heaven. Jesus has promised victory. If we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so our job right now is learning how to walk in the Spirit, to walk by the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can keep the flesh restrained and under control by the power of the Holy Spirit. But that takes a lifetime to learn. I mean, how many of you have perfected your walk with God? How many of you have perfected listening for His voice? How many of you have perfected not living by your own strength but living by His strength alone? None of us have perfected that. That's what this training is all about. So we are quite literally stuck in time. We're, we're kind of stuck in a great spiritual limbo, battling it out here on the earth, waiting for the next dispensation of grace that will set us free. And this is one thing that I want to make sure you that we get this morning. And this is, again, we're walking a fine line of balance here. But at this time, God does not expect us to be sinless or perfect. He knows that we are but dust. He understands the, fr- the, the, the fleshly frame that we inhabit. He understands the warfare. Remember in the book of Hebrews, there's two passages specifically that talks about how Jesus is your, he's your high priest. He's mediating for you. He's praying for you. And both of those passages say that Jesus sympathizes in your battle against sin because he's been here. He's experienced it himself. He knows what you're going through. And he's there before the throne of God pleading on your behalf. Not that God doesn't want to help you. That's not what that's saying. But you do have a high priest. God does understand. He doesn't condone sin. If it is habitual, deliberate, intentional sin, then that's a whole other category, and we've talked about that. But as you go through life, and the trajectory of your life Your heart passion is to pursue God, to know God, to love God, to obey God, for sin to become less and less in your life. If that's your heart's desire, I want you to know that this very morning you are covered by the blood of Jesus. And He is very patient with us. He understands what we're going through. His own Son lived here on the earth and was tempted in every way just like we are. He knows He understands. He forgives. He's patient. He understands. You have got to know that. So that when we go through times, you know, there's times when we get overwhelmed and sin overtakes us. 
we don't want to do it and we hate it afterwards, but we either get tired or we neglect prayer time or we neglect Bible time and we don't feed ourselves spiritually or circumstances overwhelm us. You know, there's lots of ways where we get overcome throughout the day and it's a battle to always be prepared. It's a battle to always be seeking Him, staying in communion with Him throughout the day. But He understands when His children get overwhelmed. Again, if your heart is bent towards evil and you enjoy sin and you plan on sinning, and that's a whole other story, but that's not what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about the child of God that really wants to do what's right. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8. It says here, now, in putting everything in subjection to Jesus, he left nothing outside of his control. And so we see this in Ephesians. We see it big time in the book of Revelation, right? Where all power and all authority has been given to Jesus, the Son, and he will rule and reign one day. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. And so it's saying here that God the Father has left nothing outside of Jesus' control, but at present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Just take a look at the world around you. This place is not in subjection to Jesus yet, but one day he will rule with a rod of iron, right? And that day is coming quickly. But right now, we don't see everything in subjection. Our own lives are not even fully in subjection as they should be and as we want them to be. So we're in this kind of spiritual limbo in which we experience great measures of His grace and forgiveness and mercy. But what do we see? We do see Jesus who suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. So we don't see everything in subjection to Jesus yet. We ourselves are not in subjection to Jesus fully yet. We're, we're pursuing that. But what we do see is the grace of God every day, covering our sin, making up for where we fall short, forgiving us each and every time. Remember this from Philippians 2, verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. So this is where, you know, in the frustration of the battle, in the frustration of the failures that come from time to time, we, we think, well, I've got to try harder. I've got to do better. And that's exactly what A.W. Tozer was talking about. Stop tinkering with your own soul. You don't know what you're doing. And when you get in God's way, then he can't do his work in the timely fashion that he wants to. So what do I do? Just do nothing? No, of course not. What do you do? You give yourselves to prayer. You give yourself to the reading of the word. You give yourself to praise and worship. You give yourself to the fellowship of the saints. And by doing so, you make yourself as available to God as possible to do the work that only he can do. And you let him start to work and probe. Remember Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides between bone and marrow, right? It divides between soul and spirit. And his word works in you. You and I can't fix ourselves. But we can give ourselves to the God who can fix us. And this is the promise, Philippians 1.6, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. You know, this is what Paul wrestled with the Galatians over. He said, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect in the flesh? You know, we, we tend to think, well, praise God, I, I was born again, and I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, and baptized in water, and that was so great. Uh, but now I got to finish the job. I got to take it from here. I got to try really hard and be really spiritual. No. The one who started the work in you is the only one who can bring it to completion, and his name is Jesus. Now look at this last phrase. 
He will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So what does that mean? Until the day of Jesus Christ, you and I are going to be struggling every day, fighting against the sin. But it's okay, because he understands and he forgives. And I want you to know, you know, when we tend to get so discouraged because we fall, if only I could express to you how proud your Heavenly Father is of you in those moments. And you know why he's proud? He's proud of you because you don't give up. He's proud because you come back to him and you ask for forgiveness. He's proud of you because you hate what you just did. He's proud of you because you want to do what's right. He's proud of you because you want to please him, your heavenly father. Those are the things that he takes great pride in and rejoices over your life. There's some other dynamics involved in, in this that you also need to understand. The closer we draw to God, the more of our sinfulness we see. You know that passage in Psalms where it says, in thy light we see light? And that's really what it's talking about. We really don't see ourselves, we really don't see each other correctly, accurately, until we see ourselves in God's light. And... We all have blind spots. We all have uh, things that we do or say or think that are wrong, even sinful, but we don't see it that way. We, we don't realize that that's sin. We don't realize that that was selfish to do that. We don't realize that that was arrogance to say that. Uh, we all have those blind spots, but the closer we get to God, the more time we spend in His presence, we begin to see, oh my gosh, that was ugly. Why did I do that? Why am I like this, right? And so the closer you get, the more you see, and, you, and, and it's easy to think, oh my gosh, I'm getting worse. No, you're not getting worse. It was there all along. You're just now seeing it. And that in and of itself is progress. That in and of itself, I mean, seeing it is half the battle, right? Now that you are seeing it, it doesn't mean you're getting worse. It means that the process has started to actually make you better. So by drawing closer to God, that spiritual growth and the process of cleansing is at work. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately sick. Who can understand it? And the answer to that rhetorical question is, not us. We don't understand it. We don't, we don't understand our own heart. We don't understand uh, the evil that's in our own heart at times. God has to reveal it to us. And that's why he says in verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind, and I'm going to show you what you're really like. And thank God he doesn't do it all at once. Thank God there's a merciful process in place called the chastening of the Lord. The other dynamic that we have to realize as we're going through this battle and trying to reconcile, I thought I was born again. I thought I'm a child of God. I thought I was a Christian. Why am I acting like this? The more we grow spiritually, the harder your flesh will rebel. Remember Romans chapter 7, verse 21. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies, what? Close at hand. It's like that, you know, when the Lord spoke to Cain right before he killed Abel, his brother, and he said, sin is crouching at the door. And sin is crouching at the door of your heart and your life. And it's crouching, waiting for the right opportunity to spring temptation upon you. This is real. This is part of the battle that we go through. How many times, just a very simple analogy, how many times have you said, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to pray? And as soon as you go to prayer, distractions happen, the phones ring, you think of ten things you have to do right then. Sin will fight you every inch of the way. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, 
but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. So remember, that is the battle. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? So the moment you say, I'm going to do right, I'm going to serve God, I'm going to please God, I'm going to obey his word, the moment you make that the intent, you've got a fight on your hands. And it's a fight from within. And the more you grow closer to God, the harder the flesh will rebel against your pursuit of God. Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. To keep you from doing the things you want to do. Realize what this is saying. Your flesh is always lusting against the spirit, the spirit that dwells within you, the Holy Spirit, your born-again spirit, and The desires of the spirit are always lusting against the desires of the flesh. So you have this internal war going on. They are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So it's, you know, it's almost, well, it's not almost, it actually is. Sin is this intelligent force in the world and in our personal lives. And it's watching. And it will rebel and fight against you every time you want to do what's right. And as you grow spiritually and grow closer to God, the rebellion of the flesh only intensifies and it gets worse. So I'm just trying to show you some different dynamics in the scriptures of why this fight, this battle that we go through every day gets weary very wearisome. And sometimes it really is going to feel like, man, I'm getting worse. But you really aren't. And then remember, God knows what you're going through. He understands and He forgives. Let me just go through this last section for this morning because we're out of time. In the Bible, there's a trinity There's a triune nature to our salvation. And you've probably heard it said before. We are saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved, right? When we say we are saved, we're talking about justification. And justification is the fact that Jesus died in your place on the cross, took your sin, took your punishment, And once and for all, you have been forgiven and you're free from sin, death, and hell. You now know that you're forgiven. You have no fear of death because you know that Jesus has paid the cost. He bore your punishments that you don't have to bear it. It's like this verse in Romans chapter 5, verse 7. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Therefore, we have now been justified by his blood. Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. That's justification. And Ephesians tells us that that is by faith, it's not by works. There's nothing you can do to earn, deserve it. It's freely given by the love of God. It's called justification. You are justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. You're headed for heaven. You have been spared from the penalty of hell. In that sense, we have been saved. It is a completed work on the cross. But there's also the meaning that we are currently being saved. And that's what we call sanctification. Sanctification takes place by what the Bible calls the chastening or the discipline of the Lord. And that is done, it's accomplished through trials in your life. 
We know that God orders your steps. The circumstances that are in your life right now are not by mistake. They're not by accident. What you're going through in your life right now are, or is ordained by God. And God knows exactly what you need. He knows the areas of your heart he needs to touch and change. And so he orchestrates relationships, events, circumstances to touch those needs in your soul at the very root, at the very center. And through that exercise, that is how we grow spiritually. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, right? I, when I look over the past year of my life, I'm thinking, dear God, why? <laughs> and I'm sure you have had years like that yourself. Why, God, did all this happen to me? Why am I going through this? Why does it feel like things are getting tougher? Well, remember, you have to look at what you're going through, and like the Apostle Paul with the thorn in the flesh, you have to pray to God and say, God, please reveal to me what you're doing here. Paul knew. He said, I'm an arrogant guy without this thorn. And this thorn has been given to me to keep me humble. Well, God has circumstances in your life to keep you humble. God has circumstances in your life to kind of beat that selfishness out of you. And it's for your good. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields what? The peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Nobody's exempt. I... Whoever you think is the most spiritual guy or girl on the planet, nobody's exempt. We all have to go through this schooling by God because we are all battling with the sin that's within. And so we have been saved. We are being saved. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, uh, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has what? Has ceased from sin. That chastisement, that discipline, is how God cleanses the sin out of our life. So that we don't live any longer for human passions, but we live for the will of God. And then next, lastly, we will be saved. So we, we have been saved, justification. We are being saved, sanctification. We will be saved in what the Bible calls glorification. And that's the part we're waiting for. We got the first two working. This stage will be the glorious stage when we will finally shed this flesh of sin and mortality shall take on immortality. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body will put on an imperishable body. Remember when Jesus came back after his resurrection and showed himself to his disciples and to the 500? Remember he sat down and he ate with them, right? Right? He walked into the room where they were gathered together. He said, here, put your hand in my side. Put your hand in the nail holes of my hands. It was a resurrected body. It was a glorified body. And one day you're going to have a body just like his, and you'll be free. There won't be any temptation. There won't be any sin. It won't be a corruptible body. It will be an incorruptible body. And he says, for this perishable body must put on the imperishable. This mortal body must put, on the, must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that it is written, death is swallowed up in what? In life or victory. What a glorious day that will be, huh? Charles Spurgeon says this, 
recollect that there are two kinds of perfection which the Christian needs. The perfection of justification in the person of Jesus and the perfection of sanctification wrought in him by the Holy Spirit. So he's kind of talking about it in terms of two different uh, two different dynamics. I talked about three different. But he goes on and he says, at present, corruption yet remains even in the breast of the regenerate. Experience soon teaches this. Has an experience taught you? The sin that still remains in your flesh? Within us are still lusts and evil imaginations. But I rejoice to know that the day is coming when God shall finish the work which He has begun, and He shall present my soul not only perfect in Christ, but perfect through the Spirit without spot or blemish or any such thing. Can it be true that this poor sinful heart of mine is to become holy even as God is holy? Can it be that this spirit which often cries, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of the sin and death, shall get rid of sin and death, that I shall have no evil things to vex my ears and no unholy thoughts to disturb my peace? Can it really be true? O happy hour, may it be hastened. When I cross the Jordan, the work of sanctification will be finished. But not till that moment shall I even claim perfection in myself. So it is what it is. We're in a battle. It's a battle for our souls. It's a battle for our eternity. We will be faithful to the end in fighting this battle. But in the process, if your heart is set upon God and pursuing Him, repenting before Him, serving Him, to the best of your ability today and the next. Be comforted that when we do fall, when we are overcome, God understands and He forgives and you are still His child. Father, we thank You for Your mercy. And we thank You for the hope of what lies ahead. Father, right now we are just, we're kind of in limbo in this awkward stage. But Lord, how we long for that day when incorruption shall overcome our corruption and we will be like You, spirit, soul, and body and temptation and lust and sin will be no more. We won't have to fight it every day like we do now. But Father, it is what it is for the moment. And so we pray that You would give us the strength, continue to chasten us, continue to teach our hands how to make war, how to win in this fight. Give us hearts that will never, ever quit. Give us hearts that will never just give up in despair. Give us hearts that will always come back to You, always repent, always ask for forgiveness, always pursue You deeper. Let Let the the cry of the psalmist be our cry. My soul follows hard after you. And no no matter how many times we fail, we will get back up and pursue again because we know that your mercy and grace has no limits for the child of God. Father, we thank you and we praise you. Keep us safe as we go now. In Jesus' name, amen.